instead of just trying to do what was popular or trying to look like other creators out there, I decided to actually put my strengths into action. And I sat down at my kitchen table and that was also kind of my office at the time. (laughs) And within an hour, I actually wrote out a blueprint that would end up really creating the brand and business that I have today. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today, we are talking all about personal branding. So this is helpful for specifically if you are a content creator, aspiring content creator, or you're looking to start your own business because understanding your brand and building a brand, growing an audience, these are all very important things to know. So if you have a message that you want to share with the world and you want to learn how to get that message out there effectively, then this episode is for you. Our guest is Julie Solomon. Personal branding coach, best-selling author, and chart-topping podcast host Julie Solomon has been empowering lives for over 15 years through her in-demand classes and masterminds. With a background in public relations for some of the world's most influential music acts and thought leaders, Julie launched her online courses and coaching mastermind in 2016, mentoring thousands of leaders and creatives around the world. Her passion is helping women turn messages into movements and empowering entrepreneurs and creatives to successfully build, grow, and scale their businesses. Recently named one of the top 100 leaders in influencer marketing, Julie and her work has been featured in Forbes, Entrepreneur, Business Weekly, Business Insider, Success, and People, among others. She's the author of the best-selling book, Get What You Want, How to Go from Unseen to Unstoppable. Hello, Julie. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. How are you doing today? I am doing great. Thank you so much for having me, Eileen. I'm so excited for our conversation. Same. Okay, so why don't you start with your story? Tell us a little bit about how you built your business and found your focus. Yeah. So really over the last, I want to say eight years now, I um, have had the business that people see now online. Prior to that, in my former life, I did work in corporate America and agency America as a publicist. That's really how I got my start. I went to college for marketing and communications and then was a music and book publicist for years before I really got into the online space. I started um, about 10 years ago as a content creator. And then over the last uh, eight years, I've been a more of an educator and a course creator and a digital marketer. But through that, over the last eight years, I've landed over seven figures in brand deals, collaborations, and partnerships. But of course, it wasn't always that way. I used to spend like 60 plus hours a week creating content, posting on Instagram, doing all the things to try to gain followers, and always just kind of felt like something was missing. Um, And so that really kind of put me on a journey that I'm sure I'm happy to talk more about on really discovering my niche and what really makes me stand out, which then led into the business that I have today. So, and that is um, an online education business. I run um, a a company called Empower You um, and I am now the face of it. So with that comes my podcast, The Influencer Podcast. It comes my programs like Pitch It Perfect. And then of course, my um, online coaching services that I have as well. Yeah. So when you made the pivot from like publicist to content creator, what was your topic? Like what were you intentionally trying to talk about influencer related stuff? Tell us about that journey. And then I want to hear about how your background gave you, you know, like gave you like the knowledge and skills to what you do now. Yeah, absolutely. So as I had mentioned, when I first started out, I was my niche was kind of like this lifestyle mommy content creator, but really I didn't have a niche. I was more just kind of like creating the kind of content that I thought was popular on Instagram at the time. And even though I had a, a very credible background in marketing and PR... I did feel like something was missing. And at the time, you know, I was just trying to make money off of my content, which I think that everyone can really relate to that. Um, I even signed up for some affiliate out- outlets and things like that, but it wasn't ever consistent enough for me. And this really led to a lot of uncomfortable confidence at the time and just really a lot of confusion in what I was creating. And so one night again, this was probably back in 2016. So at this point, I had been spending about three years on Instagram trying to build a brand. And I remember my husband having a conversation to me and he just said, Julie, like, why are you trying to be like everyone else? Like, instead of 
really tapping into what makes you unique, which is your background in publicity. And that is really, Eileen, when I had this revelation that there was a lot of smoke and mirrors around how to actually build a sustainable brand online and how to consistently get paid brand deals. And there was also this lack of information on what it actually takes and how it looks on the business end. And because I had years of working as a publicist and as a content creator, I actually did have a unique understanding of both sides of the industry. And so instead of just trying to do what was popular or trying to look like other creators out there, I decided to actually put my strengths into action. And I sat down at my kitchen table and that was also kind of my office at the time. (laughs) And within an hour, I actually wrote out a blueprint that would end up really creating the brand and business that I have today. And these are the exact steps to the quality content, the audience growth, and paid brand collabs that I ended up um, teaching people. And so first was my brand values. I had to get really clear on what my brand values were. The second was I had to create what I call a signature elevator pitch. And then the third was that I needed to develop a content strategy and a plan that really highlighted my strengths. And then, um, then I knew that I would be ready to start pitching brands. And so I took those three things, my brand values, my signature elevator pitch, and my content strategy. And I started to pitch brands and to negotiate collaborations. And what was really interesting about this, Eileen, is that at the time, I didn't really have a lot of followers. I think I had less than 10,000 followers at the time. So from 2013 to 2016, I had slowly but surely kind of built up a less than 10K following. But I started to pitch brands and I started to get these really good, consistent collaborations. And not only did it work, but it started to work really fast. And so during that year, I actually went from making $200 a month in affiliate commission to making over $75,000 in brand partnerships, all from pitching and negotiating brand deals. The other interesting thing about this is that my following started to grow. I started to build relationships with brands, which was also key to the longer term sustainability of my brand, which of course led to more collaborations. It led to media. Um, I was even able to negotiate a home makeover with a brand worth over $250,000. And it also got featured in People Magazine. Mm -hmm. And so as you can imagine, all of a sudden I had all these other content creators coming to me and they were like, Julie, I don't really mean to be rude to you, but like, how are you landing all this stuff when you have like no followers? (laughs) And I'm over here with, you know, 50, 70, hundreds of thousands of followers and I'm not able to do that. You know, so like, even though you have way less followers than I do, you're actually making more money than me. And that's when Mm -hmm. I had another revelation that everybody at the time, and I still think this is true today, everyone had been so spellbound by the glossy glamour of the creator industry that many had lost sight of the fact that what they were actually supposed to be doing was building a real business. And I think because of my background and and really the fact that I didn't have a large following to fall back on, I, d- I wasn't the most popular content creator. So I didn't really have the luxury to lose sight of that. Like I had to really start taking it seriously from the beginning. And so I think that really helped of like having my background in PR and just also not being a, you know, a big influencer at the time. But what was interesting is that when the content creators at the time found out how much I was making, you know, pitching brands with a lot less followers than they had, they were really intrigued by it and they wanted to know more from me. So that's when I realized that my brand deals that were coming in were really because of that blueprint that I had created for myself, not because of how many followers that I had. And since so many people wanted to know how I did this so they could do it themselves, I decided to create one of my first signature programs called Pitch It Perfect to help other creators do the same. And that was really the start and the catalyst of the online education business that I have today. All right, time for a break for today's sponsor, AG1. As someone who has a lot on her plate, I appreciate when there's a way to simplify while still being effective. Instead of mixing and matching countless supplements, I've been taking AG1 in the mornings. I love that it's a single solution that supports my entire body, delivering my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more. It's just one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day. 
AG1 makes it easy to nourish my body, supporting my immune and gut health. AG1 ingredients are sourced for absorption, potency, and nutrient density. Every batch of AG1 goes through a rigorous testing process so you know you're getting safe, high-quality nutrition. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily, and that's why I'm excited to welcome them as a new partner. If you want to take ownership of your health this year, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com slash lavendaire. That's drinkag1.com slash lavendaire. Check it out. Okay, so let's break this conversation down into two parts because the first part is how do you actually build a brand and build an audience online? And then the second part is how do you actually make it a business versus it just being about the numbers of like how many people follow you or how many people watch your content? Yeah. So really how to build a brand comes down to essentially five things. It's brand discovery, brand development, your marketing and your messaging, how you communicate that to your audience, and then monetization. So those are really the five things. But where I want to focus on today, which I feel like is the most important piece, but often the most overlooked piece is that brand discovery phase. So this is where I was talking a little bit about the brand values. Your brand discovery phase is that time, is that phase where you really root into not only what makes you unique and different and not only what your niche is, but more importantly, what is it that you specialize in? I think that a lot of times people you know, they kind of get lost in that word that is the niche. It's a buzzword. We hear it all the time. And you got to niche down and how to niche. And a lot of people are really repelled by that. They're very confused right. by that. A lot of people don't want to niche down because they they think that it's actually going to hurt them rather than help them. But really the opposite couldn't be true. And so the way that I look at it is that take niche off the table. Let's not focus on that. And instead, let's focus on what do you specialize in? Because once you can answer that question, I specialize specialize in blank. It allows you to really streamline and focus on what makes you unique, what your unique value proposition is to the community that you want to call in, and how you can actually serve them. And so um, a piece to that is your brand values. Really getting clear on what is important to me, what is really going to drive this ship forward. What do I feel is going to allow me to have sustainability tomorrow as well as 10 years from now. And so it's about really getting clear on those values and what it is that you specialize in. And the more specialized you are, actually the more money you can make, um, the more no like, and trust that you can build, and the more of a thought leader and authority that you are going to be to your market. And so again, a lot of times people think, if I niche down, then that means I'm going to be missing out on opportunities. But I kind of like to use the analogy of this. Let's say that you, you know, there's something wrong with your throat and it's like you're coughing and you don't know why. And you've gone to certain people and they're like, oh, it's fine. So let's say that you go to a doctor and the doctor says, okay, I know that we can't figure this out together. So I can either refer you to a specialist who knows exactly what is wrong with your throat and can help you, or I can refer you to just like this general doctor who may or may not have an idea of what's going on because they generally work on a lot of different parts of the body. Who are you going to want to go to? Obviously, specialist. Most likely the specialist right. that is going to know exactly what you need and to help you. And so that's really what I encourage people to think about is, again, like the more specialized you are, the more money you make, mm-hmm. the bigger your brand can grow and the more authority that you have. So that's really the first piece of that brand discovery and making sure that you really get clear on what it is that you specialize. And then from there, you can go into actually developing a brand strategy. And then from there, the content and the messaging that supports that strategy. And from there, calling in the right community of people that are going to want to actively and consistently engage in your content. And from there, then you can start building towards a monetization. And then that kind of goes to the second question that you said about different ways that you can monetize. There's a lot of different ways that creators can monetize online. Um, I will share a few. One is through brand deals. Another is through creating their own products and services. Um, Another is... um, 
really there's three more kind of under the brand collab that I'll talk about. So you've got your own products and services that you can sell. You've got things like a podcast that you could do and you could run ads on that, like we're talking about now or on a YouTube channel, or you could work um, with brands in partnerships. And within that category, there's subcategories. And the three most popular types of brand collaborations are sponsored posts. So this is where you create content that features the brand's product or service, um, and you can get paid for that. Then you've got affiliate partnerships, and this is where you, again, promote a brand's product or service in exchange for commission using a unique affiliate link. And then the third most popular type of brand collabs, which has really kind of come up over the last couple of years, is UGC, um, also known as user-generated content. And that is where you create content featuring the brand's product or service, and then they get to share it on their platforms. Now, what's interesting about these three most popular types of brand collabs is the compensation range and really like what I call the follower threshold. So let's go back to the sponsored posts. And that's where you create content featuring a brand's products or services, and then they pay you. The compensation range for a sponsored post can really be anywhere between a hundred dollars and hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on what the post is and depending on who the creator is. And typically creators with 500 followers or more are going to be considered for sponsored posts. There's not one magic number to that, but that is pretty like industry standard at this point. For the second one that I had mentioned earlier, the affiliate partnerships, you can make anywhere between $50 to tens of thousands of dollars through commissions, again, just depending on the creator and the partnership. And what's great about affiliate partnerships is that there really is no follower threshold that you need to hit in order to make money that way. And then the final one, which was the user-generated content, you can make, again, anywhere between 100 bucks to hundreds of thousands of dollars for creating UGC. And there's no follower threshold there. As long as you create quality content, it really doesn't matter how many followers you have because that's not the purpose or the goal of that content. The purpose of the goal of that content is for the brand to be able to share it and use it and promote it. And so... I think it's important just to first address those three popular types of brand collabs since that is one of the most frequently asked questions that I get Mm -hmm. and really what type of content is required in order to actually make money with brands. And um, I think it's also important to note that the types of brand collaborations can vary you know, really wildly depending on factors like the creator's niche, which again, that's why it's so important. The more that you specialize, the easier it's going to be to make money and get these deals. The audience size, the engagement rate, um, the specific industry, which is why I believe a blueprint is a must to follow. Um, So that way you're not banking on the things that you can't change, but you're really focusing on your brand strategy and what you can change. And At this point, I've worked with tens of thousands of creators in hundreds of different niches and industries that have seen success, really like random ones too, like including scuba diving, virtual reality, mixology, um, tiny house living, um, culinary, you know, adventure stuff, DIY, like you name it, it's been done. So I think that's another thing that people feel like their niche is like too unique or too specialized that they wouldn't actually be able to get brand deals. But that that's actually not true either. So let me know if that answers your question. Totally. That's That gives us a really good foundation to start so that people who are interested in this industry like understand a little bit more about how it works. Let's get down to the more like nitty gritty of like how to hone in on your brand and your message. Like how do you, because I know a lot of people are confused when, yeah, it makes sense when you say niche down, but like how do you how do you know what makes you special? And you you mentioned a blueprint. So what do you mean by like blueprint? Yeah, so really it's about following a protocol or a methodology to be able to differentiate yourself. And so what you want to look at is your unique voice, your background, your style, your core ideas, um, what you may bring to the table that somebody else doesn't. And so I'll give an example. Like when I was first starting with the story that I shared earlier, At the time, I wouldn't have thought that my background in PR 
would have really been able to do much for me as this aspiring lifestyle content creator. To be honest, back then, I didn't really think it was sexy. I wanted to actually remove myself from being known as a publicist because I wanted to be known as a content creator and influencer. That's really what we called ourselves at the time. But it wasn't until I really started to honor more of my background and the fact that I was a publicist for so long and, and I did have these strengths and, co- and qualities and understanding marketing and messaging that I was able to then really hone in on what makes me unique and different and really what my niche was. You know, my, my niche ended up kind of becoming the fact that I had that background. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll give you another example. I have a friend of mine who is now a brand founder for a clean beauty skincare company, but in her past life, she was a CPA. And she would have never thought that her being a CPA would ever have anything to do with clean beauty. But if it wasn't for her understanding and background in money and things like finances and projections, that actually helped her really set up her business from the get-go to make sure that it was healthy and sound. And so when it comes to what you specialize in and what makes you unique, you want to kind of think about those factors, those three things of what are you really, really good at? What do you have a background in? What do you have an expertise in? Um, Mixed with this idea of what lights you up what do you want to be known for when you think about, you know, this idea of, you know, five years from now, when people think of your name, they think of what, right? So it's like, what do you do really well? What, what do you want to be known for? And then most importantly, what your customer needs and cares about you know, your ideal customer. Maybe it's not the the people that are following you now, but again, that version of yourself that you're stepping into, the people that you want to serve, what do they need from you? What do they care about? What are they looking for? And then you also want to kind of look at the prop- at the competitive landscape and think about that. What, what is out there that, that is working? You know, when you think about your competition, what do they do really well? And then where is there maybe some white space that you can fill that gap? So again, it's what you do well, Uh, what you want to be known for, what your customer, your ideal customer really needs and wants from you, and then what your competition does really well. And in that marrying of those things, there's going to be a little sweet spot there that becomes your unique value proposition. And that's what you want to hone in on. Um, And I'll give you another example of how I really utilize my background. So what I did really well at the time was not necessarily content creation. It was more PR and marketing. What my ideal customer really needed and cared about was they wanted to grow on social media. They wanted to to make money and they didn't know how to do it. And then what my competition did really well, when I would think about who would have been my competitors at the time, and it was probably, you know, not necessarily other content creators, but maybe... Um, companies that those content creators were going to for education or for advice or for help that maybe they could help them with certain things, but then there was something that was missing there. And for my situation, it was that understanding of how to pitch themselves and how to work with brands and Mm -hmm. how to negotiate brand deals. And so I was able to fill that gap. So I think that for anyone that's listening to this, if you're having a hard time with niching down and really figuring out what that is for you, you need to ask yourself, what do I do really well? What do people just normally naturally come to me for? What is my background and experience in? When I think about my future and what really lights me up and what I'm really passionate about, what does that look like? And then what customer base do I want to serve? And what do they need? And what do they care about? And how can I be in service to them? And then what in the landscape right now, in the competitive landscape, what is a hole that I can fill? And really start to hone in on that. That again goes back to that brand discovery piece that I was talking about earlier and the importance of really using that time to lay the foundation. What tends to happen, Eileen, is that People don't want to do this work. It's hard. It's not fun. It's not sexy. It's work. And so what they tend to do is they tend to try to avoid this of like, I don't really need a unique value proposition. I don't really need to niche down. I don't really need to focus on these things. I'm just going to create content. I'm just going to try to build a community. I'm just going to try to monetize. And that might work a little bit to a degree, but it's never going to be that consistent 
sustainability that people strive for until they do this work. Mm -hmm. So I kind of think about it like a ladder. Like they keep trying to go up the ladder, but the reason why they're not getting to the top and they keep kind of falling is because they're not starting from where they need to start. And then they're working their way up. They're trying to like jump on the ladder. Like they're trying to jump straight to content creation or jump straight to monetization or jump straight to building a community with actually without actually having the foundation built first. And so that's why sooner or or later, whether you want to start there when you just get started or whether you have to kind of not start over, but you're going to have to go back two years from now, five years from now when it's not working, the brand discovery piece is the most vital step. And it's one that you can't avoid. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds really important. You have to like understand the foundation and also like the sweet spot where like everything meets. Cause I think a lot of people, they focus on what they want to create, but not what people need from them. And so obviously it just doesn't go as, as far. Right. My question for you is say you're working towards this one niche, but then your interests shift, right? Like sometimes people evolve and they want to like branch out into another niche, but what is your take on that? Yeah. So I love this question. And I get this a lot of like, Julie, I want to pivot or like, I want to switch gears, but I'm afraid to because... I expand, right? Yeah. I want to expand. I want to evolve. But this thing now that I'm doing, it, it is making me money and it's what I have been known for. And so I'm afraid, like, how do I actually pivot and not lose money and, you know, not lose followers and not all these things. And so the best advice that I give to people is like, you can still do that stuff that you're doing now. Just don't talk about it. And I'll give you an example. So my, one of my, like my niche is brand strategy. There's a couple of different ways that I can offer that to somebody. They can, you know, listen to my free podcast. They can take one of my free trainings that I have. They can join one of my paid programs and courses or group coaching programs. One of the things that I don't offer that's not in my niche, I don't specialize in it, is one-to-one coaching. And it's because it doesn't light me up. It's not scalable. And it's just not something that I necessarily want to market and promote. However, there have been times along my journey when someone has come to me and they're like, Julie, do you offer one-on-one coaching? And if I think about it in that moment and I'm like, well, what is this opportunity presenting to me? Can I really support this person on a one-to-one level? Is this something that I want to do? And if it is, I might say yes, but I'm not publicly marketing and positioning myself as a one-on-one coach. So that's what I tell people that if you want to start to pivot, you want to start to forward facing, you want to start marketing and messaging and talking about where it is that you're going, who you're wanting to serve and that new niche that you're stepping into. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to say no in the interim for opportunities that may come your way for kind of more of that past version of yourself that you were, that you're trying to leave. But you want to focus more of the marketing and messaging on where you're going. Mm -hmm. So you can still say yes to those opportunities in the interim if they're making you money. You just don't want to talk about it as a marketing piece. Does that make sense? Right. Like you want to market yourself based on your future vision of who you want to be, right? Exactly. And where you're going and that niche that you're wanting to step into. And so I love to use that example of one-on-one coaching. It's not that I don't do it or haven't done it. I just don't talk about doing it, you know, because it's not, it's not what I want to be known for. It's not where you're trying to go. Exactly. Let's take another break for today's sponsor, Shopify. Of all the things I've created, I'm most proud of the Artist of Life workbook and our online shop. For the past five years, we've been proudly hosting our shop on Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business with their all-in-one e-commerce platform. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkouts, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. Through Shopify, we've been able to reach customers from all over the world. Their interface is easy to use and they organize the data you need to understand and grow your business. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US and powers millions of businesses of every size across 160. 75 countries. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash TLL, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash TLL now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash TLL. 
I guess another common question that people get is like, how do you come up, how do you make sure you come up with good content ideas? Like, do you have advice for, you know, once you figured out your brand and positioning, how do you then plan the content strategy? Yes. So to me, I really think that this comes down to your elevator pitch because your elevator pitch is actually what explains what you do and who you are in a way that someone can understand very quickly and easily. And then from that, your it's like your audience actually becomes a sounding board that will reveal to you the type of content that you should create. And really without this, what ends up happening is that your audience may struggle to understand the essence of your content, which leads to confusion, confusion and disengagement. You're going to have more of what I call like brand ambiguity because it becomes muddled and it makes it harder for your audience to really associate more of a clear or memorable idea or image or um, thought process with your content. And then it also gives you a competitive disadvantage advantage because you struggle to stand out. And so instead of, I feel like you've got to start here first of like, let's get really clear on what your elevator pitch is. And I actually have a really simple formula that people can follow. Your elevator pitch is who you are, So that's basically you introducing yourself and your brand. It's what you offer, which is the core of your content or services. It's how you serve others. So this is the methods, the approaches, the channels that you use to deliver your content and services. And then the last piece is why it's important. And this why is really what drives your content and services. Who you are, what you offer, how it serves others, and why it's important. And the more that you can start focusing your content creation around those key elements, it's going to start attracting your ideal audience, which is most important. And it's going to start really kind of giving you the roadmap to your content creation. So you don't have to worry about trying to quote unquote, figure out what to create. The the why is going to be there for you and it's going to be revealed. So it kind of reminds me of like those new Tesla vehicles that drive themselves. Like, yes, we may be in the car, but like we're not necessarily having to like touch the wheel and maneuver and drive because it's driving itself. We've got to turn the car on. We've got to be in there to get from A to point B, but we don't have to be the ones driving it. And so I always love to start with my elevator pitch. It also keeps me, again, aligned with my uh, niche, with my brand values and what it is that I specialize in as well. So that's kind of the first step to that. And then the second step is really about being open and receptive to the feedback. The best way to do this, because I'll hear a lot, I don't know if you hear this, but someone can say, well, Julie, you know, I've tried to ask my audience, I've tried to survey them and ask them what they want, and no one responds to me. And well, first off, if no one responds to you, that's a clear indication that you're probably, you probably need to go back to that brand discovery phase because you probably haven't gotten really clear on what makes you unique and different, which means that your audience doesn't know what makes you unique and different, which means they don't really care as much to consistently engage in your content. So that's a a first kind of like red flag piece. But then the second piece from there, it's about asking better questions. And it's also about looking at the data. We now have so much great data available to us inside the TikTok and Instagram platforms themselves with the insights that it's all there. Like what content people like, what they don't like, what time to post, which ones did well, which ones had reach, which ones had which ones had the most saves, the most shares, the most impressions. It's all there telling a story. We just have to take the time to actually look at it. And I don't think that people really review their data enough and really use that as a driving force to further dictate the content that they're creating. The other upside and beauty to this is that once you start to really pay attention to the data, you can see what kind of content in the past did really well. And you can literally just repurpose that piece of content, like just save the raw file, post it again 90 days Mm -hmm. from now. I mean... That's very common to do, and that helps with just the overwhelm of content creation. And then the next thing to do, it's also going to give you ideas about how could I create something new that's very similar to this thing that did well. Yeah. You're bringing it down in a way where it's like, you have to base it off of data. It's like, it's very, like, it just makes sense, right? Instead of just like coming up with random ideas and trying them. Right. And I think that's what most people do. They just like, 
make up this idea out of thin air. They're like, I'm going to create this piece of content that's not backed by any data and then it's not going to do well. And then I'm going to make up and tell myself that it didn't do well because I'm not good at what I do. It's like, no, you're just not pulling it from, right. from stats and data. Right, right. You're just literally making it up in your head and then you know, having some kind of unrealistic expectation around it. Do you have any thoughts on like how to build a sustainable schedule for creators to avoid burnout? Because that's also another big thing is that social media is so fast paced. How do people keep up? Yeah, that's such a great question. And that's one that I also get a lot as well. Um, it's actually why I have um, something that I call called the brand accelerator formula. And we've talked a lot about brand discovery. That's that's a piece to this formula that I have. But time management is actually the first step because I believe that without time management, like you just said, I mean, you're just, you're going to be so stacked against so much of what you need and you're never going to be able to really, no matter how hard you try, you're never really going to be able to even get to the brand discovery or the brand development or refining your messaging or your marketing. So I call it efficiency. Efficiency really is all about your time management and how you show up in the world and how you're able to make this happen. I feel like for someone's brand without time management, what it kind of feels like is, and you kind of mentioned this too, it's like you're constantly in a reactive state. Priorities are falling through the cracks. You're constantly putting out fires. It's like you're drowning in this bottomless to-do pit. And the way to improve and to get out of that is really to implement effective time management techniques to optimize your daily tasks and activities. And it's definitely a balancing act. I think that it's a lot easier said than done. But the most important piece is to make it as doable as possible. So the way that I do it is by having a very defined batching strategy every week. And what I mean by that is that I reserve specific blocks of time each week for specific tasks and focuses. So um, obviously each brand and person and business is going to be different. But I'll give you an example of what mine is like. So for example, Monday is my content creation day. Tuesdays are my meeting and call and podcast recording days. Wednesday is for more like research if I need it, strategy development. Thursday is for more podcasting if I need that or if I'm going to go on people's podcasts like we're doing this on a Thursday mm -hmm. right now. And really without this defined batching strategy literally my business could not run. And I don't think anybody's business could run. And so I have a day that's really just dedicated for certain things. And then Friday is usually just like, whatever I want. You know, that's the day that I'll go to doctor's appointments and I'll meet girlfriends for lunch and I'll just do things like that. And um, so for me, I have found that this bal balancing act, which is really dedicating specific things on specific days has really helped me. And I can even go deeper on this if you would like. Yeah, like give us more tips of time management, like what you figured out in your system because you've been doing this for so long. Let's just go deeper on the Monday piece so people can understand right. what's possible with the system. So Monday is my content creation day. And what I do is I review any kind of notes if I have them from the previous week just to kind of see what, what content needs to be created. Maybe I go and look at some of that data. Maybe I go and look at some of the stats and insights. Um, maybe I'll look at a launch schedule if we're in the middle of a launch, you know, and I'll check my content strategy plan to see what I need. Maybe I'll just scroll on Instagram for about, you know, five minutes to see if there's any inspiration that calls out to me. And then I'll ask myself from there, I'm like, okay, based off of what I know I want to create for this week, do I need new footage? Do I need to record something new? Can I pull from any old footage that I have? Am I repurposing something? If I need to film new footage, I'm going to know that I need to do that. And really, filming new content can take me anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour on a Monday, depending what I need to do. And then also on this Monday, I'll also spend this day writing out the captions for the entire week based on the content that I just decided that I was going to create. And then I have a content schedule and I'll add it to the content schedule. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be about four to five pieces of content because I really, I don't post every day. I don't believe that that's necessary. So I try to post about four to five times a week and, um, and then I'll write out the captions and so that maybe takes me for four to five pieces of content. It may take me like 30 minutes to write the captions out. About 
10 minutes to an hour or so to get all the footage together. And then I'll draft all the content for the week in the Instagram app. And that takes me another 30 minutes to an hour. So the total time on this Monday, I have my entire week of content mapped out and it's taken me roughly 90 minutes to about three hours of just focused time on this because I've put this plan in place. So after that, I have the rest of the day on Monday to really do whatever I need to do, to work on other things, to check emails, to do whatever it is that's important. But my content creation is the priority on Monday. It's not going to fall through the cracks because it's the first thing that I started focusing on when I got to work that day. And I have this batching process in place for each day to make it as easy on myself as possible. And I think the other important thing here to note is that my content creation now in 2024, it doesn't take me as long because of the fact that I've done the work again with that brand discovery piece. I have my unique values defined. I know what my unique proposition is. I know what I'm talking about, what I specialize in, what my niche in, what what my niche is, what my audience wants to hear from me. So it it makes the time to actually think about what content I'm creating so much easier Mm, and faster. Yeah. So for anyone that's listening to this, if you're someone who finds yourself spending all of your time trying to create content, then you really need to be thinking about where am I missing the mark here when it comes to my content plan, my content strategy? Am I just creating content for the sake of creating content? Or does my content actually have a goal? Where is it leading me to? What really is the end goal? And I think that that's something else when it comes to content that could help people is you kind of have to reverse engineer it. My end goal is to not create content. (laughs) My end goal is to turn my engaged community of podcast listeners and of Instagram followers into buyers of my programs if I'm the right person to serve them. So if my end goal is to get people you know, inside my paid programs, then I have to be keeping that in mind. And so I'll use that as kind of a compass to drive my content forward. Also knowing like, what are the strategies and the tips and the challenges that my audience needs help with? And that's how I drive the content. And that's how I'm able to batch it and get it all done in one day for the rest of the week. Yeah. Cause you have a clear goal, you know who you are and where you're going. I love it. Yeah. There's nothing like feeling confident in your own skin, which is why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, One Skin. Their products make it easy to keep your skin healthy while looking and feeling your best. No complicated routine, just simple, scientifically validated solutions. The secret is One Skin's proprietary OS1 peptide. It's the first ingredient proven to switch off the aging cells that cause lines, wrinkles, and thinning skin. And they've got several studies to back it up. I've been using their products for a while now, but don't just take my word for it. One Skin has over 4,000 five-star reviews and were recognized by Fast Company as one of the most innovative brands in 2024. One Skin is the world's first skin longevity company. By focusing on the cellular aspects of aging, One Skin keeps your skin looking and acting younger for longer. Get started today with 15% off using the code TLL at oneskin.co. That's 15% off oneskin.co with the code TLL. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. So please support the show and tell them we sent you. Do you feel that you're growing with your audience as in like, you know, because if you've been on a platform for a while, your audience is growing, they're changing and you're changing too. So do you feel like you evolve your content based on that growth or do you just create similar types of content trying to reach new audiences? audiences that are your ideal audience. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think it I think it really depends again on the offers that you have and again what your end goal is. So for me, it's it's kind of a bit of both. I have solutions to problems that I solve for people Mm -hmm. that have been consistently the same since way back in 2016. So one example is brand deals and partnerships. If someone wants to work with great brands, get paid to monetize their content and they don't know how to do it, they can come to me, come to my podcast, come to my trainings and learn how to do that. And that has always been there since I started creating education-based content. And that's not going anywhere anytime soon. 
The next piece to that puzzle, though, is what you said. There has been a growth and an evolution, not only in me and what I'm able to do and how I'm able to, to serve and show up, but also an evolution of my, my buyer and my student. You know, there's that person that might have learned how to monetize their their brand and their content five years ago, but now they want to create their own products and services. And how do they do that? Or now they want to build an email list. And how do they do that? Or now they want to write a book or speak on stages. And how do they do that? Now they want to build a higher level network, um, you know, so they can build more of their personal brand. And how do they do that? And so then that's when people have to make the, co- the conscious decision of, we can't be a solution provider for everything mm-hmm. that maybe, you know, a customer needs, but we can be for some things. And so that really goes back again to the bigger vision of the brand. You know, what are you really good at? What do you feel called to do? What are you passionate about? And what does that person need or want from you? And so that's really how I base it. And so the lane that I really stay in is brand strategy. I help people build and scale personal brands, but specifically how I do that is through the lens of personal branding and really that messaging piece Mm -hmm. and how are they building out who they are as a personal brand that makes them unique. Because to me, unique equals equals sustainability. That is what is going to make sure that someone's here tomorrow, five years from now, 10 years from now. And then the other thing is the monetization piece and helping people build out multiple streams of revenue so they can have that sustainability. Yeah. So you don't really try to do it all because you understand even though people need new things, like you can't offer it to everyone. It sounds to me like you're focused on your niche and what you're offering. Yes. And, And the thing that people need to realize is that there will always be options available to you. Like if I, you just, you have to declare what it is that you specialize in and just know that like, as long as you are in a growing market, which if you're on social media, you're on, you're in a growing market. None of us are in a dying market. So as long as you're in a dying market, like you're going to have people that are interested that need solutions to the problems that you provide. I see. Um, okay. Another question that I think people struggle with is like, what, what do you do when you feel like you've hit a plateau, right? Like some creators are like, they, they feel like they're doing everything right and they're creating consistently everything, but they, they somehow just hit a plateau. Maybe the algorithm changes and you know, it, it, that it just happens to everyone. So what is your advice for that? How do you shake yourself out of it? Yes. So I think this is a two part here. Um, I think there's two reasons why someone can hit a plateau. Um, one is burnout. And then the second is, again, there's not clarity in their unique value and like how that is supporting their audience. And so they start to get a lack of interest in the content that they're creating, which act, which then just cla- this causes a an engagement plateau. Mm-hmm. So you first have to get clear on what kind of plateau am I having? Like, am I, am I burnt out just because I've been doing so much and like, I just need a break? Or is it that I am creating a lot of stuff, but it's not gaining momentum. And so there's there's some kind of uh, miscommunication happening here. So that's the first piece that you need to get clear on. If it's the burnout piece and you just need a break, that's when we just need to like get away from our desks, get off our phone, go outside, maybe go on a trip, read a book, go take a walk, like mm-hmm. really take time for whatever you define as self-care, really root into that. So for me, that's like, you know, again, I said, because of my my content schedule and, and how I my plan my work week out, Fridays are my free days. So that's like self-care day. I'll go get facials. I'll hang out with friends. I'll go for a walk. Um, I, I take Pilates three times a week. Like I try to do these things that get me out of my own head and get me out of my own way so I can remember to see the bigger picture of like, why am I doing all of this? Yep. Like what for? Mm-hmm. Like what, what is the purpose? What is my bigger why? Because I think that everyone needs to have a why and your why has to be greater than any excuse that you would ever have to not bring your why to life. And so really me taking time to myself and going to Pilates and getting facials, that that just gives me space between the work and me to keep me rooted in my why. And that's really important. 
The second piece is if you're having a plateau because your content is not reaching the people it's meant to reach, your offer, no one's buying what it is that you're selling, then that again goes back into there's some kind of mismatch with your messaging, with your strategy, and with your unique value proposition that you need to get clear on to make sure that people really understand what it is that you are meant to serve and sell them. So that's where, again, your unique value proposition comes into play. The definition of that is really, you know, it's a distinctive and appealing value or advantage that your content, your services, your brand provides to your target audience. It really represents what distinguishes you from others in your niche and industry. And To sum it up, Eileen, it's your UVP is really the compelling reason why potential followers or buyers would choose to connect and support you over anyone else. And if that is not clear to you, then it's not going to be clear to anybody else. And so you could also be hitting a plateau because you have not gotten as clear as you need to be on your unique value proposition. There's a lot of people out there that's like, well, I've been doing this for years. I know my niche. I know what makes me unique. And that's fine. You can know it. But if other people don't know it, then it doesn't matter if you know it. (laughs) Like you may know it, but if you're not effective at articulating it out to people for them to know it, then it doesn't matter. And so that could be another reason why the plateau is happening. And if that's the case, then you just need to get support on really getting clear on that messaging piece. Right. So it's two parts. It's like knowing your value and then being able to communicate it clearly so that people get it. Exactly. Okay. So for you and your business, I guess what in general, what do you attribute the most of your success to? And what was the catalyst for your growth? Was it just like getting super clear on, on all those things? Is there, are there any other tips that you could share? Yeah. I mean, definitely clarity is, is key. And I think that a, a bit of that is like, I think a lot of times people wait for confidence to do something but it's actually the clarity that gives you confidence, not the other way around. So for me, it's not that I always waited for the confidence to do something. If I ever waited for the confidence or the courage, like the confidence to do something, I would never do it. (laughs) So I just needed to find the courage to get the clarity. So the clarity is key, but I think it's also important just to be realistic, to know that the clarity is not all going to come at once. It wasn't like on some sunny day in 2016, I woke up and just had all of this clarity on what I was doing. Not at all. It was an evolution and a process and a lot of, you know, misdirections and trial and errors and testing things out and things, a lot of things not working out, a lot of things not going the way that they were supposed to be going. But the key here to what I'm saying is that I tested it out. I tried stuff. I was like, let's see if this sticks. Let's see if this sticks. Is this going to work? While at the same time, not just throwing spaghetti at the wall, but doing it in a strategic way to where I had a clear path. Here's the idea. Here's the bigger vision. Here's the goal that I'm aiming at. So let's see if we can shoot that bow and arrow and hit the target instead of just throwing darts blindfolded. So I think that that's an important takeaway for people is that A lot of people just think that they can think their way to clarity, and that's not where clarity comes from. Clarity comes from the action of doing. So you have to get out there and you have to get started. However, there's another caveat to that. A lot of times you hear this idea of like, just get started, just take action. You just need to get started. And I do agree with that, but I think there's a piece to that sentence that's missing, and it's you need to get started and make sure that you're getting started on the right thing to make it easier for you in the long run. I think a lot of times people just start creating content for the sake of creating content without making sure that they're getting started with a strategy and a foundation in place. And so to me, I think that that's what's really helped me is that I have always understood the importance of strategy. And even if I didn't know the strategy, I would research, read books, read podcasts, higher coaches, I would do what I needed to do to learn the strategy. If I want to bake a cake, I have to have a recipe. And if I don't have the recipe myself, I have to go and get it. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to bake a cake that anyone wants to eat, you know? (laughs) So think of it that way. You can't bake a cake unless you have the right formula to follow. Mm -hmm. And so I was always very 
resilient and I was very honest with myself about where my strengths were and where they weren't. I wasn't afraid to test things out in a strategic way. Mm -hmm. And I'm always open to not being the smartest person in the room. And I think the most important piece to this, Eileen, is that I learned very early on that you cannot be successful trying to grow a business by yourself. There's not a single successful business in America that has one person working at it. (laughs) So this is a business, even a brand. Like I don't know any like successful brand. Think of five brands that you aspire to be like one day. And I promise you there's more than one person working behind that. And so I think that's the other thing that people have got to get out of this idea of like, I can't afford help or let me just do this on my own, or I'm just getting started. So I need to figure things out before I hire people. It's like, how do you think you figure this stuff out? You think it's just going to like implant itself in your brain? No, you have to like get support. You have to get help. You have to really take the action in that way. So I think the support is is huge there. Like everything you talked about today was really clarifying that you have to have like a strategy and you have to do the work. Most people don't want to do this work, but you have to like break it down, understand yourself in order to have a clear path forward. Otherwise, most creators are just trying to like bake a cake without having any recipe. They're just testing different things, right? They're just putting random right. ingredients together. And it was just like me when I started. Yeah. 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 Like I get it. I was that way too. I was just basically seeing what other creators were doing online. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to like piecemeal it together myself. And it's not that I was copying them, but I was like, okay, so they're doing that. Okay. So let me see if I can do that, but do it this way. And it's like, the thing is, it's kind of like an iceberg. When you're on the outside looking in, you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. You're only seeing the what's happening on the front yep. end and on the public end of what that creator is doing. You're not seeing all of the back end yeah. strategy, support, yep. systems, et cetera, that it took for that creator, for that brand, for that business to show you the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. And so that's the other thing that's a little misleading is that you have to remember like, it, you you have to give yourself the permission to go deeper and to see what's underneath that surface. Yeah, such good advice. Um, so now, Julie, what are you looking forward to and excited about now? Yeah, so this year it's all about really showing up and serving and supporting um, in in a just a bigger way. We the influencer podcast, which is my podcast, um, I've been releasing episodes ever since 2017. We just went from one episode a week to two episodes a week as a way just to have more guests on the show and really add more value. So I'm really excited about that. My program, Pitch It Perfect, is getting a big rehaul where we're adding a lot more content and really good strategy in there. So if anyone is interested in monetizing their content or working with brands, we've got great support for that as well. I have a free training for that. If anyone wants to check it out, they can just go to um, pitchitperfect.net slash uh, masterclass to get that information. But really excited about the work that we're doing there. And then um, just staying in my lane of brand strategy and creating really good quality content for that. So people can, of course, listen to the podcast for that. They can join that free training to get a taste of that, or they can follow me on Instagram to kind of see what we're doing there. But those are really the things that I'm most excited about. And then I'm also turning 40 this year, which is just crazy. (laughs) I can't believe that. So in August, I'll be 40 40 years old. And I'm really excited just to embrace a new decade of life coming in. My 20s were really hard. My 30s were very transformative and big and like life-changing. You know, in my 30s, I had, I got married, I had a family, I made my first million. Like there were so many mm-hmm. big moments in my 30s that I really, really loved. And so I think that if that's any indication of how my 40s are going to be, yeah. I'm really looking It'll forward be even to better. it. But I'm also coming into a new decade with just a different level of wisdom and confidence and just not caring so much about what other people think. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's part of like getting older and wiser. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it's so freeing. So I'm I'm entering my 40s in a much different way than I was entering my 30s. So I'm also really excited about that. I love it. It's another glow up level. It's like, I just feel like, like people don't like, as you get older and older, you just become more and more yourself and more and more comfortable with your true self. And it's, I see that as really fun. Yeah. Same. All right. Do you have any final pieces of advice that you want to leave the listeners with today? 
You know, I think the advice that I would love to leave the listeners with is that if they have now been on, you know, almost an hour of listening to you and I talk and they are still here right now, I would just be curious to maybe think that there is something in them that they are wanting to share with the world they haven't quite gotten to yet. And whether that's that they're making up and telling themselves that they need more information or who are they to do that? Or what if someone's going to think something weird about them if they do? Um, My advice to them would just be to remember that it's all about one step at a time. And if you can just give yourself the permission to take that one step, I promise you more will be revealed and you just have to keep moving forward. That is really the only thing because I think that No one ever regrets trying something, but everyone regrets not trying something. And so I think that that is the biggest takeaway that I would have for anyone that's still listening. Amazing. Thank you so much, Julie. Lastly, where can we find you online? Yes. So you can, I tend to hang out the most on Instagram. You can find me at Jules Solomon. That's J-U-L-S-S-O-L-O-M-O-N. I'm also uh, wherever you love to listen to podcasts. So the Influencer Podcast, it's on Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, all the places. And then my website is juliesolomon.net. And that's where you can go and learn more about me. And then if you're wanting to work with brands, you can go over to pitchitperfect.net and learn all about the program that we have there. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom today. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you. 